One of the things that I want to mention tonight is just to remind us of the context of um, of the Song of Songs. We live in uh, the Western culture that's in, been influenced uh, by rationalistic thinking, individualistic thinking, um, reductionary thinking. We are reading a book uh, that was developed and produced in an Eastern culture. And so it, it makes it harder, I think, to understand. Uh, I think it makes it harder maybe even for some to accept some of the things that we have been reading about. Um, like the significance of dreams. In the Eastern culture, there is a very, um, there's a lot of, a lot of emphasis placed on dreams and a lot of, um, a, a lot of credence given to the idea of, of interpreting and understanding how God may be speaking through dreams. Uh, the way relationships are carried out is another difference. And I think that unless we acknowledge and are aware of that, it makes it harder for us to, to grasp some of the things that, is, that are being spoken in the Song of Songs. So I, I want you, as best you can tonight, and in all of our study of the Song of Songs, to put away your Western eyes and your Western mentality and try to better understand this uh, from a 3,000 year old perspective in an Eastern culture. And I think that's, that, that can be very helpful to us as we, uh, as we continue to study. So let's talk about one of those things I mentioned that are, that I think are different sometimes between how Eastern culture and a Western culture interprets things, and that's that's the area of dreams. Um, probably most of you have had somebody come up to you and say, wow, I had a dream last night, or you've gotten up in the morning and you've been disturbed by a dream. If you're like me and you've had one of those dreams where you have uh, been falling and falling and falling, uh, and you know your heart is pounding in, in you know that dreams have an impact on you, but in the Western culture, largely, historically, I think this has changed a little bit in more recent years, we've kind of dismissed dreams as, as not so, you know, not, we've, we've assumed that it, it's more, um, it's more, um, superstition than, than it is anything that, that merits our concern or our interest. But that's not the way the Bible paints it. And so let's talk about dreams. Dreams have, a, have held special significance in people's lives. We see from the lives of Joseph and Daniel that the interpretation of dreams was a much desired ability. What do you think is the purpose of dreams? And does God still speak through dreams today? What do you think to get us started along this? I don't know if I could uh, speak to the, the purpose of dreams. I mean, obviously there's some sort of emotional uh, purpose behind it. I know I've woken up, like you were saying, disturbed from a dream and kind of changed the way I went through the day. And so I think that's how God speaks through it is, uh, for me, through those those dreams that you wake up and it's like, oh, no. I mean, it's today's going to be different because of that. Okay. You attach some significance probably perhaps for the day. It may be useful to let you know that from a therapeutic standpoint 
most dreams are viewed as the mind's unconscious way of, of processing conscious material that we don't want to face. Uh, for instance, you may feel stuck in a relationship and you end up having this dream about being locked in a room and feeling uh, anxious about being locked in this room. Well, what's really going on? Well, I, I think most therapists would say you're, you're feeling stuck in your relationship. So that's how a lot of um, counseling therapists interpret dreams. Uh, other thoughts about dreams? Um, well, for Joseph and Daniel, um, when I was thinking about it, I uh, thought how God kind of revealed what he was going to do um, in the lives of Pharaoh and Nebuchadnezzar and um, just the people. And one of the verses when I went and read in Daniel, um, it's chapter 2, verse 22, and it says, he reveals deep and hidden things. Mm. And, um, and I think that you know, maybe God is, doesn't tell us explicitly, like, what's going to happen in our lives, like maybe he did in the stories of Joseph and Daniel, but like you said, he might reveal to us what path we're on, like what will happen if we continue down the path that we're on, or, um, you know, if we're struggling with something or dealing with maybe even a past hurt, um, he might help us to work through it by even bringing it up as an issue in our dreams. Yeah, and, and what you're saying is that there's our dreams allow sometimes the mind to process things that are going on in the heart. Um, I I think um, it was interesting to me when Jack Cummings shared. He said that he he he's been fired from three different preaching jobs, and he said before each of those firings, he had a dream about a tornado coming through town and wiping out the town. I found that kind of interesting um, for that. But the Song of Solomon includes uh, perhaps a couple of dreams, and we're going to be talking about one of them, a dream sequence, uh, even tonight. So let's jump in to uh, verses one through four of the Song of Songs, and somebody read that for us, please. Chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. All night long on my bed, I looked for the one my heart loves. I looked for him, but did not find him. I will get up now and go about the city, through its streets and squares. I will search for the one my heart loves. So I looked for him, but did not find him. The watchmen found me as they made their rounds in the city. Have you seen the one my heart loves? Scarcely had I passed him when I found the one my heart loves. I held him and would not let him go till I had brought him to my mother's house, to the room of the one who conceived me. Okay. Um, she says the setting is that she's on her bed at night. And, and, and here's what happens. What, there's some anxiety here. What's her anxiety about? She can't find her love. She can't find um, her lover. She can't find the, the, the one that she loves. And so what does she do? Gets up and goes look for him. All right, she gets up. She goes and looks for him. Uh, she asked about him, uh, but she can't find him. She, what's her desire in verse 4? Uh, to hold him and not let him go and uh, bring her to the room of her mother's house. Okay. She doesn't want to lose him. So what's the fear going, being expressed here? What's she processing in her dream? I think um, she has a, a large, um, not an unhealthy, but a dependency on, she's just become close to him and developed an emotional attachment to him. And I think that vulnerability is, um, is scary and the yearning for her, 
the yearning that she experiences for him is um, is scary for her and she's trying to process that you know what happens if it's not returned or if you know something happens to him if I lose him um, you know and then there's been that um, unfulfilled longing they're not married yet so or maybe they are um, but I'm not sure <laughs> I mm -hmm. are they married yet <laughs> we're going to talk about that later. okay <laughs> yeah. anyway if they're not married then there's not that commitment there yet so she has that to to think about that sounds pretty human doesn't it you know you're in a you're in a relationship and for whatever reason you're feeling some insecurities about it and so there's there's this processing that goes on and for her uh, she's having this dream sequence and, and she's having a hard time finding him. Her desire is to bring him home. Her desire is, is to make him hers, but she's, she's feeling threatened, uh, about that. So what does it tell you that she's processing subconsciously? She's, she's processing the, the fear of losing him. She wants to take him to her family. She's dreaming of him. And so um, she's processing the threats. And as we're gonna read later in chapter, chapter three, she may be processing uh, Solomon as a threat. Or that Solomon in effect interrupted her dream as we'll talk about in just a moment. It's, it's her lover that is the true love and bright spot in her life. In fact, when verse four, she's using pretty assertive language to talk about the, her initiative in this relationship. She feels um, comfortable being the initiator in the relationship. She feels even emboldened to be the initiator in the relationship. So. Um, there's a comfort level here and she doesn't want to lose that all right we're going to come back to uh the song in just a moment but i want to do an aside here of god's plan for marriage so let's go back again to genesis 2 and read verses 18 through 25 and talk about what we learn about the nature of marriage and God's design for it. So somebody read those verses for us. The Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make, it, make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them, and whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Okay, uh, what do we learn from this passage about the nature of marriage and God's design for it? What's something you see? She's suitable and she's to be his helper and a companion. Okay. Eve was created as a helper or a compliment um, to Adam. She was not constructed, created as a clone. And one of the things that we find out rather quickly within marriage is that there are differences between men and women 
in many ways. There are differences in how we communicate. There are differences in how we uh, engage in uh, relationship and in sexual uh, activity, how we respond to it, how we, um, how we engage in it. And those differences oftentimes create confusion, conflict even. And so um, why do you think God would make men and women so different? We're going to talk about some of those differences a little bit more, especially as it relates to sexuality in one of the later lessons. But why would God create us so differently? I think um, he allows us, we're different and we complement each other, um, but the differences cause us to have to seek each other and seek after one another. And I think that brings us closer in intimacy. Yeah, it's, it, it's not much of a challenge uh, to, to be kind and compassionate and loving towards someone who is just like you. Someone who is, has some differences, it becomes more of a challenge. And so I, I think really in many ways the, the home and the marriage rela relationship in particular is intended to teach us how to love like Jesus loves. It's, it's a laboratory for um, developing the kind of love that, that we see that Jesus has. And so I think rather than resent that, I mean, it's created tremendous conflict in a lot of relationships. We need to, to learn from that and what, what it is that we're, maybe areas that we're deficient, areas that we need to grow in. Uh, and, and the marriage relationship will oftentimes point that out. What else do you see is God's design for marriage? I mean, one of the obvious things is that we were created for relationship, um, relationship with God. The, the aloneness was something that God said is not good. So marriage is meant uh, to, to be a companionship and a friendship. What else? It's meant to be exclusive. Um with the husband and wife leaving their families and any um, extraneous relationships and becoming one flesh. Yes. Uh, in, in fact, one of the things I try to make explicit when I do a wedding is that even if it's your parents or children that become a potential wedge between the husband and wife, they're an unwelcomed intruder into the relationship. This is supposed to be uh, become the uh, primary relationship, human relationship in a person's life. What else do you see? I guess in the context of the class, uh... It says the man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Uh, so, I mean, kind of like last week how we talked about some people have speculated that the Garden of Eden was a sexual fantasy or a uh, playground, or I, I can't remember the word you used, but uh, just the fact that they were, like there wasn't any, any, they just felt no shame. There wasn't any sort of immaturity about that. Yeah. And Nobody was self-conscious. Uh, nobody was saying, is this, is this bad? There, were, there was an enjoyment of the oneness that both speaks of a selflessness and a, um, a sexual relationship between Adam and Eve. What, what do you make of the fact that he brought, right before he introduced Eve, he brought the animals in front of Adam and Eve, Adam to, to name them? What do you make of that? Consider this, 
what would Adam have noticed as these animals were brought in front of him? There's at least two things I think that would have stood out to Adam. None of them were like him. All right, none of them were like him. The world is a fascinating place with a lot of interesting animals, but there are none like Adam, none on the intellectual level, uh, none who look like him. I mean, for all the evolutionary nonsense, no apes, uh, no chimps look like humans. What's the other thing that he would have noticed as the animals were paraded in front of him? That there was a mate for each one of them. There was a Mr. and Mrs. Hippo. There was a Mr. and Mrs. Rabbit. There was a Mr. and Mrs. Wolf. What, what do you think Adam would have, would have noticed about his situation? There's not a Mrs. Adam. There's no Mrs. Adam. That's exactly right. Isn't it interesting that, that this is what God did for Adam immediately before he created Eve? So I think the implication is that God wants us to appreciate the uniqueness of this gift um, of marriage. That it's, you know, marriage is, marriage is not spoken of highly uh, in some places. And that's unfortunate because God intended for it to be esteemed. It, he meant for marriage to be held in honor because he created it as a blessing for Adam. And so it's in that context that, um, that we we're talking about the Song of Songs in God's bigger context of what a, a committed, lasting relationship is supposed to be like. So going to the next question which kind of ties to uh, the Genesis question when a bride and groom have their first view uh, on their wedding day that, that was that's been a new thing for me and I, I don't did we, did we have a first view when I walked down the aisle well yeah but I don't even remember it re being referred to as first view no it wasn't okay when a bride and groom have their first view on their wedding day whether it whether that is as she walks down the aisle or as they take pictures prior to the wedding. It's often an, an exciting time. I've seen people cry, jump up and down, and start laughing when they see each other for the first time. What's all the excitement about? Now, Andrea, you're, 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 you and Trent are pretty close to newlyweds. What's the excitement about? I think it's um, that waiting period has culminated into um, finally we're, you know, about to experience life together. And um, it just feels like, it feels like a gift. Like we're finally here at this point where, um, you know, we're going to experience things together. We're going to experience sex together. We're going to build a family together. You know, hopefully we're going to spend our days together. And it it's uh, kind of an overwhelming time because it's just like where it all kind of comes to a point, you know. So it it is really exciting. And I remember it, you know, uh, probably because it was not so far along ago. But <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, th there's, there's, a, there's a lot of immediate changes that take place, aren't there? And, and, and they're good. They, they're a little bit stressful. But, wow, what exciting new things uh, to, to get to enjoy. Those of you who may, may not be newlyweds, okay? I'm not going to name names. But those of you who are not newlyweds, what's all the excitement about? What's all the excitement about? Well, I, I, it has been a long time. It's been 33 plus years, but I can remember thinking, I get to go home with you now. Like after dates, it was always you go your way, I go my way. But now it's like our home, I go home, you go home, it's the same home. So I remember that being a, a neat feeling. 
we get to, when we both go home, it's together. It's interesting in talking to um, two of our children and their spouses uh, who have recently married. And as I've talked with some newlyweds, I said, what's the best part about about marriage? And there are very few exceptions to them saying, we don't have to say goodnight and leave each other. Um, we, we just, we're together. It's like a sleepover every night with your best friend. Sleepover every night. That sounded so romantic, Laurie. That was, uh, that was beautiful. Um, now, I don't want to, Steve, are you wanting to say something? We're still laughing about the sleepover, but yes, I, I want to reiterate that. You know, when Lynn and I were dating and we got married when we were very young, uh -huh. we would date and then go home and talk to each other for another hour. So it was the ability to not ever say goodbye. Yeah. The ability to be in your presence the whole time and to grow as one unit. And so, Sonny, we're still laughing about the sleepover, Lori. I just want you to know that. <laughs> it's true, though, right? It is so true. Oh. It's been a great 50 plus year sleepover for us, I'll tell you. That's great. <laughs> That's what we love to hear. I mean, I, I commented in the last week on two of our. Um, Two of our Green Lawn members uh, who were who were nearing 50 years of marriage walking hand in hand together uh, to to the assembly or away from the assembly and how how neat that is. Well, here's the deal. The wedding is a divine moment. It's it's a time of covenant making. So it's very serious. And couples oftentimes have spiritual symbols to um, to. Uh, signify the seriousness and, and nature of their commitment, like candles or the mixing of sand or uh, the branding. Um, that's one of the things that um, um, I got to witness last summer, uh, taking the Lord's Supper together as, uh, as a couple. And one of the things I try to emphasize is that people who attend the weddings have a responsibility to help the couple keep their vows. And so this is, this is a very uh, sacred time, a sacred moment. And for me, unfortunately, I think there are way too many couples who are too, too concerned about their wedding and not concerned enough about their marriage. Um, the wedding is this grand event and people get hyped up and spend tons of money for it and give little attention to the marriage, and that's unfortunate. Um, but it's great to know that he or she is mine and we're going to get to enjoy one another fully as part of God's gift of sex. That's part of his design that we see in Genesis chapter 2. 18 through 25. So with that in mind, let's turn back to the Song of Songs. Somebody read verse 5 for us from chapter 3. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field. Do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. Okay, you remember that? You remember those same words from chapter 2 and verse 7? This is, this is not the first time that we see those words of warning. This is the second time this warning is given. Why is it given here? Why is it given here? Remember what's going on. She's in a dream sequence. She's uh, expressing some of her fears. What, what, why would it be given here? Uh, all I can really think of is that she's so wrapped up in the emotion of it that uh, she's also warning other daughters of Jerusalem to uh, just be careful with that. Uh, don't let that overwhelm you. And when you do find your love, don't, uh, don't be carried away with it. 
Okay, very good. I think I think you're right uh, right on line. Anybody else want to say, Andrea? Um, yeah, that's pretty much what I was going to say. But um, there's also an element of if um, you have a fear that you're going to lose someone, to try and um, to capture that relationship with you know any method you know how. And I think a lot of times. Um, young girls feel that pressure to, um, to give in to sexual intimacy before the time is right in order because of those insecurities. And so, um, you know, I think it's important and like she's doing here, kind of talking herself and maybe admonishing others that, um, it's going to be okay. Be confident in the one that you love and know that waiting is, is the appropriate thing to do. Uh, that's very well said. It, 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 many a young girl, unfortunately, has felt the pressure and some have given in uh, that in order to hold the young man that they desire, they, uh, they give of themselves uh, before it's time. So she realizes that her desires were getting the best of her and that if you feed those dreams, if you feed those lusts, uh, she could endanger love. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.22. He said, flee youthful lusts. And one of the, really it's disturbing, uh, one of the disturbing accounts of scripture is the story of Amnon and Tamar in 2 Samuel chapter 13. These are half brother and half sister. Verse 1 of 2 Samuel 13 says, Amnon fell in love with his half-sister Tamar. Now, that's not a quote, but that's a paraphrase of what verse 1 says. And through the, uh, through the uh, evil advice of his cousin, Amnon ends up raping his half-sister. And Verse 15 of 2 Samuel says something very interesting. After verse 1 says Amnon fell in love with Tamar, it says in verse 15, suddenly Amnon's love turned to hate, and he hated her even more than he had loved her. I actually have a sermon somewhere in my archives uh, that is entitled... Um, or, or something to the effect that that love can that lust can be the death of love because he did not Amnon did not uh, regard the kind of warnings that beloved is giving giving in uh, the Song of Psalms. He didn't show the kind of restraint. He didn't show the kind of respect for her. He didn't show respect for the, uh, the mores and morals of, of the day. And that destroyed that relationship. And so while some people think that um, um, giving yourself physically is, is strengthening to the relationship uh, prematurely, uh, in reality, most times it is it, it undermines the relationship. And so uh, that warning is given here. Any other comments or questions about that? Let me just say before we go on to uh, to read the next few verses, these are very real temptations. I mean, when you have a strong attraction to someone physically and emotionally, the, the, uh, the temptation and desire to, to become more and more physical, to become more and more sexual is very real. I mean, we experience it. We know that it's real. And I think that's part of why this admonition, this uh, warning is given here because it, it's, it, there's, there's a, a realistic understanding about this. There's, there's a, an acceptance of what is um, being conveyed here. It's, the Bible's not naive about what we're like as humans. 
God knows that the, that these are tempting things. And that's why the Bible's pretty direct and explicit about it. And I think we can be thankful for that. Okay? Can I ask a question real quick? You bet Sorry. you can. Uh, so if these, if, if sex is good, and before you get married, you have these strong feelings, is, does marriage, is that grounds for both the, or the couple to just finally act on all of that? Or in marriage, do you still have to learn to control all that? You're grinning. Why are you grinning? I don't know. Okay. She doesn't know. Um, <laughs> yes in, and yes. <laughs> in marriage, Josh, um, a couple should feel complete freedom to enjoy each other. Now, if a couple has, has sought to follow God's will, that's going to be probably a gradual process. Um, you know, it's, it's hard, especially if, if you've grown up in a home where you were told um, wrongly that sex is evil, don't do it. And, and that's your mentality about it. And then all of a sudden you get into marriage and you're supposed to flip this switch. Some people find that very hard to do. Uh, in fact, I will tell you that I talked with a woman one time who said that's what she grew up with, that sex is evil. And then when she went in and got married, um, for her first 10 years she fit of marriage, she felt like um, <laughs> she felt dirty having sex. And, and she said, God bless my husband, you know, that that he he endured me dealing with those kind of messages. So I, I'm saying that, and I use that illustration to say this, if a couple is, is seeking God's will, that, that knowing and that giving self fully and that, that allowing self, uh, allowing one another to experiment and, and get to know one another in every aspect is usually a gradual thing. And I think that's part of why that sex can be better in your 60th year than it was in your first year. Because, yeah, the, the, the physical aspect, I mean, you, you, you've got hormones and you're young and, and all of that's um, to your benefit to enjoy physical pleasure in your first year. But if a couple has grown and, and they have been able to give themselves unashamedly and unreservedly to one another through the years, it, it can be better 60 years into the relationship. Okay. So yes, a couple, once they have said, I do, and her husband and wife, are free to give themselves completely to one another, okay? And that needs to be talked about. Uh, there needs to be respect for what is comfortable and, and um, what each is comfortable with. Um, but it probably is going to be something that a couple grows into gradually. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir, thank you. Okay. Yeah, that's why Laurie said yes and yes. She wanted to make, she wanted to go on record for saying that. All right. Somebody read verses 6 through 11 then for us. Who is this coming up from the wilderness like a column of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and incense, made from all the spices of the merchant? Look. It is Solomon's carriage, escorted by 60 warriors, the noblest of Israel, all of them wearing the sword, all experienced in battle, each with his sword at his side, prepared for the terrors of the night. King Solomon made for himself the carriage. He made it out of the wood from Lebanon. Its posts he made of silver, its base of gold. Its seat was upholstered with purple, its interior inlaid with love. Daughters of Jerusalem, 
Come out and look, you daughters of Zion. Look on King Solomon wearing a crown, the crown with which his mother crowned him on the day of his wedding, the day his heart rejoiced. Okay, this is probably the passage that most read and they say, well, this is a love story about Solomon and his bride. Uh, let me suggest to you, as I did in the beginning, an alternate reading of this. Verse 6 talks about coming in from the wilderness. Um, let me just read the question, and, and uh, this is most likely an interruption to Beloved's dream and brings her back to reality. Uh, the desert is a place of harshness. That's where Solomon comes from. And the allusion to his chariot surrounded by soldiers is likely a reference to Solomon's bed with soldiers around to keep his maidens in as much as it is to keep intruders out. In other words, what she is talking about here is She's in the midst of this dream about her beloved, and it gets interrupted because it's her time to be sacrificed for Solomon's pleasure. It highlights one of the abuses of God's gift. And, and again, part of this is based on um, what we know about Solomon for, from Scripture. The memory of Solomon was not a flattering memory. You'll remember when his son, when Solomon died and Rehoboam, his, his uh, son, took over. What was the request the people made? They came to Rehoboam and they said, um, would you make things a little lighter on us than your father did? He was pretty ruthless. He was pretty harsh on us. Will you make things lighter for us? And of course, Rehoboam was foolish enough to say in his own arrogance, you think my dad made it hard on you? Just wait until you see what I do. And that's how the uh, nation got split between Judah and Israel. But Solomon was apparently not highly regarded by the people because of his ruthlessness. We also know that he was um, excessive, seemingly, in everything he did. So I don't think that this is um, speaking of, of Solomon's attractiveness to beloved. I think. She is actually say, talking about him interrupting her dream of the one she actually loves. Okay? Accept that if you want to. Uh, don't accept it if you want to. But here is what the question I want us to consider uh, in light of the possibility that this is, as I've um, explained it, uh, Solomon interrupting her dream she being part of his harem, she has to come and, and um, fulfill her duty to him uh, as part of his harem. What are some of the ways that sex is abused in our world today? thing with human trafficking it's used as a way of making money all right in human trafficking uh sex trafficking uh, there's there's money to be made i was pretty astonished one day when i heard somebody talk about uh that sex trafficking is a pretty uh, significant industry in the city of lubbock So that's an abuse of God's gift. What else? I think um, it's often used as kind of like a like a band aid or a quick fix um, when there's emotional pain or 
lack of discipline, maybe boredom, um, and people think that that'll, you know, um, kind of, it'll bring pleasure and make them feel better. Okay, sometimes it's used as a salve to, um, to smooth over hurts rather than dealing with those hurts or conflicts. Okay, what else? Uh, I, I think it's, um, it's abused by, sometimes it's used as a form of torture, uh, not, not so much like sex trafficking, but um, as you were talking about earlier, when Paul writes about flee from sexual sin, um, you know, you think about all, even just looking at a magazine in the store um, makes either whether it's a guy or a girl desire and um, go crazy and just perverts their mind. Mm. And so if, if you're a Christian in today's world and uh, it's kind of torture, if you know, especially if you're uh, unmarried, uh, if you're seem like it's a long way from that. Uh, I just think about, you know, like my cousin being in high school, uh, even what I experienced in high school uh, and knowing that was so far down the road, marriage that, uh, it's kind of having to wait is it's almost like they want you to join in with them and being uh, provocative. Okay. You said a lot in there, Josh. Um, bodies, sexuality is used to sell practically everything. And, and through that, Humans are objectified into simply bodies and dis instead of people. That would be an abuse of sex. Um, uh, you didn't say it explicitly, but pornography is uh, an abuse of sex uh, in whatever form that uh, the pornography takes. Um, prostitution is another abuse. Uh, domestic violence, adultery, fornication, using sex to manipulate someone to get what you want is another abuse of, uh, of sex. Insensitivity by a husband or wife can lead to emotionless sex without love. So there are lots of abuses that we could come up with and that we've mentioned here, but let me say the mistake I think that even the church has been a part of is that, yes, there are abuses, but repression of God's gift of sex is not the answer. Repentance is the answer. Now, where there have been abuses, we don't need to repress sex. What we need to do is rep repent of the abuses of sex. And, and I'm not sure the church has always done a good job of communicating the difference between those two things. And so I want to be sure and say that tonight. Uh, any more thoughts about that? Comments, questions? Okay. I'm interested in your uh, your own personal view in this next question. Based on what we've studied tonight, we've talked uh, about marriage, we've talked about dreams, we've talked about um, uh, warnings r related to sexuality, we've talked about abuses of sex. What important message do you think our world should know based on what we've studied tonight? One of the most important things about sex, I think that the world doesn't know or realize um, <clears throat> is that it's to be cherished and that within marriage it is valuable and it's fulfilling, um, but that outside of marriage it's not. And <clears throat> I think um, something that would be 
of great significance for people to realize is that waiting for it and, um, you know, listening to what God tells us through scripture and through our dreams and um, through other people, uh, wiser and who have had experience um, is uh, important in the waiting. Like as we wait, we should be listening and learning and um, that it will be, that we'll be able to be fulfilled by God, um, you know, even if we're not to be married, but um, certainly if we are with the sexual relationship. Very good. So uh, Andrea is saying, talking about the importance of uh, guarding the sacredness of sex. Okay. Someone else, what, what do you think our world should know from what we've talked about tonight? Well, uh, lust and love are two different things. Men and women are, are very different about how they view the role of sex in a marriage. There has to be some open discussions and honest discussions about how you make that intimate moment special for both. You have to continue to talk about that. And then you need to understand, maybe even do some study outside of, of uh, uh, what we normally come to the table thinking about sex and saying that hey, a woman views it from this perspective, a man views it from this. I think if you have those discussions openly and honestly, then you can grow together. But if you don't, you'll continue to keep that world's perspective. And that world's perspective is just a lust perspective. And we're being flooded with it. Our children are being flooded, our grandchildren. Uh, very well said, very well said. Um, you sound like a guy who's uh, uh, been at this for a while. So that's good. Been in love for 50, well, 51 years, actually 52 years, but married oh, that's good. Married for 50. Get all those years in, Steve. Uh, yeah, you better. Because I, I know Linda's counting them, so. Uh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah, and, and so here's the deal. In our world today, we don't have too much discussion about sex. We don't have enough right discussion about sex. That's the problem. Um, it, it's, it's talked about a lot. It's, it's on the minds of people a lot. It, it's not that we're talking about it too much, okay? We're just not talking about it in the right ways. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, we, and so uh, let me just say it again. We don't need, and church and God's people don't need to be part of repressing sex. What we need to do is to paint a godly picture of it. We need to paint it the way God intended for it to be painted. And when that's painted, I think it will be blessing to people. And Steve alluded to much of that in his comments. Someone else, what do you think needs to be our world needs to to hear well i think it's it's important i guess similar to what you said is that uh, the world needs to know that god meant uh sexual relations as a gift to a uh, man and wife you know that it's a gift it's not wrong there's nothing wrong with it within the the boundaries of marriage and I think if we just say that, that it's a gift from God for a husband and a wife, that speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. It makes, it gets people thinking and wondering, well, why would he or she say that? Maybe I need to ask questions or read in the Bible and see where does it really say that? I think yeah. it, it's important. It, it opens up um, a lot of conversation about you know, who God is. Yeah, yeah, great, great points, Maria. I think um, when, when you have questions, I mean, maybe you all have had people that you could turn to, but when you have questions about sex, it's unfortunate that, that many Christians don't have anybody to turn to and ask questions of. Well, if, if I'm asking them questions about sex, either that means I'm a loser because I don't know what I'm doing, or you know uh, they'll think I'm I'm a pervert or something. 
No, again, the problem is not that we're talking about it too much. We're not talking about it enough in the right way. And so in, in God's community of people, we need to have this holy, sacred view of sex and talk about it truthfully, talk about it openly and honestly, and encourage people who are married to enjoy it to the fullest. And that's what we kind of see in the Song of Songs. And we'll be talking about it more as we go from here. So much enjoyed being with you all tonight. Um, our time comes and goes pretty quickly. So thank you for making that um, the way it works. And um, if all goes well, uh, we will see you all again here next week. And so have a blessed rest of the week and we'll see you Sunday and then uh, again on Wednesday here.